everybody, I'm Nick. In this video, I'm going to show you a different approach to building APIs in .NET. Instead of using controllers, we're going to use something called API Endpoints, which is a library created by Steve Smith or Douglas. If at any point you think that this is cool, please go ahead and give a star on GitHub because it really helps those creators keep working on those open source projects. And without any further ado, let's go straight into the code. If you like the type of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, ring the notification bell, and for more training, check out nickchapsas.com. So let me show you what I have here. And by the way, as I'm going to be explaining things and showing different approaches, don't think that this new way is the only way you should go ahead using. It is just a way. And if it makes sense to you, then use it. If it doesn't, just know it's there, ignore it and move forward. It, you have to be pragmatic. You don't want to be dogmatic with those things. So let me show you what I have here. I have a simple customer's um, API here and I have my customer's controller um, extending the controller base and having an API controller attribute. And then we have our get all, get by ID, create, update and delete your typical CRUD uh, setup. And then based on the responses from that service, uh, we are returning the appropriate response, maybe status code, maybe OK with the object, maybe bad request if the create customer request is uh, not as expected by the API. And then I have this simple customer service, which is kind of acting like an in-memory database. We have a dictionary here uh, and every customer is stored internally. So it's not calling a database. This is done so the video is more focused and digestible because we only really focus on the API side of things, not really the database side of things. So this is the basic setup. And if I go ahead and just run this quickly, just to show you uh, what we're dealing with, um, I'll open this and you can see that I can call this endpoint and see that there is no uh, customers in the system. I can go ahead and create me in the system. And now here I am. I have an ID as well. I'm going to copy that. And if I go back to the customers, you're going to see me here created. And then I can go and get myself by ID. Here we go. I'm here. And then I can update me if I need to. So I'm going to specify an ID and then uh, a different uh, first name. So Nicolas, um, here we go. So this was down here updated. And if I go to the delete, I can delete me. That's it. And if I go back, you see that none of this exists. Now. So this is the main idea of this API. Now, this is good and all, but controllers, the concept is a bit weird. It's coming from the MVC side of things where it kind of makes sense to implement the MVC uh, pattern. But these actions, these methods are things that no one is really explicitly calling and they're all in this single uh, customer's controller, which in this case is well organized because they are all on that specific um, domain concern, the customer. But it can really get out of hand with adding like ad hoc um, endpoints in APIs and all that. It's a bit of a weird thing. Um, and what I liked about MVC is that they actually introduced something called Razor Pages a while back. And it is this more isolated idea that you're dealing with this very specific thing, this very specific page, and that page has some code associated with it. And you only need to look at one thing to know what's going on. API endpoints is pretty much the same idea. It will allow us to focus on a specific thing. And it's very likely that anything after the controller on what you're doing right now is actually looking like this, especially if you're using something like Mediator. Um, you're doing this subconsciously. So let's just go ahead and see what I mean by this API endpoints things. So we're going to go in this project over here, the with API endpoints, and I'm going to show you what I have. I have the same customer service. I have the same customer model. I have the same uh, everything really, but I don't have any controllers. I don't have any way to interface with that data. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to go to the dependencies and type in API endpoints. And we're going to find this package over here from our Dallas, uh, that's Steve Smith. We're going to go ahead and add it in the project. And now, again, I haven't really touched anything in the program.cs. It's the same as the one on the controllers approach. But what I can do now is I can go here and I can create a new folder. And I'm going to call that endpoints. And then in here, I'm going to vertically slice my domain concerns, in my case, the customer. So I'm going to say customers or customer. It really depends on, on how you're going to go about this. I'm just going to say customers. So I'm going to go and create a new class and I'm going to call that get all customers 
endpoint. Now you don't have to be so explicit with your name because it's already in the customer's folder. You could omit the customer's part and just say get all endpoint. And actually because it's in the endpoints folder, you can omit the endpoint part as well and just call it get all. I'm going to have the full name just so you can see exactly what's going on. But in your uh, own code, you can just change that if you want. So let's create that class. And now what I need to do is I'm going to go ahead and extend the base async endpoint. And as you can see, I have an error. So this isn't actually something that's working. But I can say dot without request because we're getting all the customers and all the customers don't really have an object, a request object to, to get all the customers in this case. Uh, so let me just new line this so you can see it without request. And then the response is with response, a list of customers. So this right out of the get go is way more explicit and the intent is there. When I get all customers, that's my endpoint, and I don't have a request and the response looks like this. It just kind of reads better. And if I go ahead and implement missing members, I do have my cancellation token if I need to, and I can change that uh, to a default. Here we go. Um, and then this method, this handle async method is like my playground. This is where I can actually implement my logic. And the great thing about this is that you only need to inject what this specific endpoint needs, because in the controller, you might inject like three, four, five things, which is a bit excessive, but you can, uh, and not all actions will use those things. So with this approach, you can inject only what you need. In this case, it's still the customer service, but use your imagination. I'm sure you have, and I have as well, controllers that inject things that not everything is using. So now they have that, I can go back to the controllers and cheat and just copy the code because I'm a bit lazy. So I'm gonna copy that and paste it here. This is an async alternative. So I'm gonna say, async task here and this is get all async now we're not done but the the main code is here what i need to do now is go to this handle async method and add the http get attribute and this is the customers so this is enough for for this endpoint and if i go ahead and i run this watch what happens so my api is now running i can go back and i only add the I get all customers, so I'm going to do that and I'm going to call it. And as you can see, it works. In fact, if I stop this and debug it and I stick a breakpoint here, here we go. And I go ahead and I call that. As you can see, I'm hitting the breakpoint as if it was a controller. I'm getting all my customers back and then I'm returning them with an OK. And this is, to me anyway, way more focused. In a controller, usually to get around how misused or how fat they can get, you would actually use something like mediator to push to a different uh, handler and deal with that. And sure, you still can, because remember, this is still like an API level concern. It is not your domain area yet. But for simpler things, or if you architect your application differently, this can be very powerful stuff. Um, I'm going to go ahead and implement all the other endpoints now, and I'm not going to do that one by one. Um, on camera because it will get boring. I'm going to add them and then talk you through what I've done and then see how it all works together. So I have added all the endpoints now. So I'm going to go ahead and debug it and show you how they all work and the fact that they do actually work. Uh, so get all, it returns an empty array. If I create a new customer, here we go. I have my new ID. I am created and I can see me here. This is all going to this new API, by the way. I can get me by ID. So here we go. I can go ahead and update me with a full name instead. Here we go. And then I can delete me. So I am deleted. If I try again, not found. And if I get all, I'm not here anymore. So this is all working, but look how more neatly separated the concerns are. Create is in create, delete is in delete, get is in get, get all, and so on and so forth. And let, let's just see the create, for example, right? Now, create is something that has a request and it has a response. So it is a base async endpoint with a request. The request is the customer, and that's what will be used here in this handle async method. The request will come as a request here, and it will infer that it is from the body. And then I can specify the response so I know when I'm asserting against that, that, hey, this expects a customer. Um, and Swagger will actually use that, and we're going to see Swagger in a second. Now, I'm only using the single 
customer object here, but realistically you would have a create customer request object that maps into whatever you're doing and then you're returning a customer response object. But just to keep this a bit more focused, I'm using a single customer object. Now, let's see something that's more interesting, which is the update. The update one has uh, both a route parameter and a body parameter. So I've created this update customer request object, which is more, which contains both of my things because I can't really have multiple um, objects in this request or with request method. Uh, so it, it has to look like this. So I did that, but the problem is if you do that, SPNet Core kind of messes things up and this ID ends up both in the route and also in the body. So for that, I've pulled this from multi-source attribute, which allows you to specify in a single object from where you want to get different things. And it actually works very reliably in this setup. I didn't write this code. I got it from Stack Overflow, but yeah, it's, it's a very handy thing. And as you can see here, I'm using the from multi-source attribute here and it works wonders. I'm able to have the ID in the route and then the customer in the body. Now I like this, the separation that it brings. I think it's a great thing. Would I use it everywhere? No, in fact, I kind of prefer minimal APIs. And actually if Steve was to do that with minimal APIs backing it up, I would be more likely to use it in more places because I like the setup. In fact, I have independently a year ago done something similar without knowing this package exists. So I clearly like the idea. However, what I want to nail down is that this is fundamentally still a controller. If you go to the base endpoint async class, which is what everything is inheriting from, this is still an API controller. It is a controller base. So behind the scenes, you're not sacrificing any performance. It is just using C-sharp to provide a better experience or what hopes to be a better experience to building APIs with simple endpoints, which I appreciate because in things like this, usually you sacrifice performance. That's not the case here. Now, if I also run this again and I'm going to go to the website, but I'm going to try to show you the Swagger page. So this supports Swagger, but you see that because these are really controllers behind the scenes, uh, they have this weird create customer endpoint and they're separated and that's not really nice. You can actually fix that. What you want to do is you're going to go to the dependencies and add a package called swashbuckle.aspinetcore.annotation. So I'm going to go ahead and add that here. And then this allows me to, let's say, go to the get all um, customers endpoint to add. Let me just stop you. Here we go. To add the swagger operation attribute. And this attribute has some properties I can set to manipulate what those annotations show up as in the front end. So first I can have a summary and that is the gets all customers. Then I can have a description. In this case, I'm just going to say again, gets all customers. I don't need to differentiate that. Then I can give it an operation ID and this is a customer dot get all operation. And then I can use tags and I'm going to give it a tag called customer endpoint. And this one is important because what's what happens now, uh, actually, before I show you what happens, I have to go to the program.cs and in the add swagger gen, I have to say options.enable annotations. And once I do that, I can run this and then I can go back to swagger and watch what happens now. Now, this thing is in the customer endpoint section. Now I'm going to go ahead and add that same Swagger operations thing on every single one of those endpoints and see what happens. So now this is added for every endpoint. So I'm going to go ahead and debug this again and go to Swagger and let's see what we have now. So as you can see now, everything has a description. Everything is under that customer endpoint, or you can call it endpoint if you want. Um, and everything has its schema and what's expecting as a contract. So it's very nice. You don't really sacrifice any of that swagger goodness by separating them like that. You can just annotate them and it all works, which I appreciate. And overall, I really like this. I can see it being very handy as well. For example, if you have like a metrics um, controller or like a health checks controller that you stuff things in for load balances and other services to check what the application's health is. I can see having individual endpoints being more handy because you only have to deal with that thing, which is the metrics collection for Prometheus or the application's health for my load balancer. So this is really nice stuff. I really like it. Again, if you like this too, give it a star on GitHub. It really, really helps. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. 
Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.